Hey, everybody, welcome back. This is Emily Moyer. Laura Wilson is with me today, and I will explain that in just a moment. But before we get started on today's show, I wanted to let everyone know if you are watching this on the Off Planet Media YouTube channel, this show and some of my others will still continue to appear here, but all of my work can be found on the Emily Moyer YouTube channel, and all the shows that I post here will be available first, so go over there and hit subscribe, and now we're on with the show. So um, this is episode number six of Internal Alchemy, and we have a returning guest. Dr. Keys is with us, or I call her Dr. Keys, other people call her Dr. K, or Dr. Keysberry, or whatever, and she was the first guest on Internal Alchemy, and it's been about a year, so we're going to have her back, but also, Laura and I I have been doing the health and wellness meetup chat group for our patrons um, for a couple of months now, and Laura decided she was ready to make a go at seeing how she did on a show. So she may occasionally, occasionally, occasionally appear on the Internal Alchemy show here with me. So today's the first time, and I, I, we picked today because um, this is a um, guest, a, a, a patron suggestion. Uh, driven show today. Um, I want to just do a little shout out. I don't know. Hopefully he's okay with me saying this. So I'm just going to call him Phil. <laughs> so that if he doesn't want to be identified, he can't be. But uh, um, he had been, sent me some requests about doing a show on thyroid or he wanted me to answer some questions for him about thyroid and about Epstein-Barr virus. And these are both issues that actually Laura has dealt with and that I know that Dr. Keyes is really good on. So I also, so Phil, so thank you for the suggestions. I think this is going to be an interesting show. And I also know that you're having a particularly hard week, Phil. So my love goes out to you and I hope you're doing okay. And with that, Dr. Keyes, welcome back to Internal Alchemy. How are you doing? Thank you so much. Fine. Thank you. Everything's good. Cool. All right. Well, the world is insanely crazy. And instead of playing to that noise, we're just going to focus in on issues that are actually real and actually matter. <laughs> so, yeah. all right. Okay. So he, Phil, what I'm going to do is Phil had, had sent some good detailed questions. I have some of my own. So I'm going to just go with what we kind of want to talk about regarding the thyroid. And if, he, if his answers haven't been covered by the time we're at the end, then I'll just kind of straight up ask those. Um, but we want to get into thyroid because this is something that has come, she's always known she had thyroid issues. Also, wait, before we get started, Laura, welcome to Internal Alchemy for the first time. Thanks for having me, Emily. <laughs> <laughs> so she's always known she had some thyroid issues, or at least for most of her adult life. And I never was aware of it until the first time I went to see you. Uh, and you informed me of an interesting kind of thyroid issue that I hadn't heard before, and we'll get to that. But before we get into like the deeper, weirder stuff related to the thyroid, like, can you just sort of like give people a background on like the thyroid, why it's important, and some of the conditions that you often find with people related to thyroid? Oh, sure. So the thyroid, if anyone doesn't know, it's situated right here at the base of the neck. And then if you, act, if you put your fingers side to side, you can actually probably feel it pushing a soft spongy type gland in between your fingers. And so the thing to often check, and I tell people this all the time, is you should be doing this regularly to see if all of a sudden something feels different because people with enlarged thyroids can actually feel it much more easily when it gets to a certain size. Then, of course, other people will start going, what's that on the, what's going on with your neck type of thing, you know? But yeah, so that's always where I start. The thyroid is so important. It's all, to me, it feels like because every patient, I would say, well, 99% of my patients come in with something going on with their thyroid is just super important in all facets. Metabolism, very big. Most people that have a thyroid problem are either a little skinnier than they would like, majority a little heavier than they would like, right? So that's where metabolism, metabolism comes in. Your body energy, that comes from the thyroid. When the thyroid's affected, it also affects hormones and it does that via the liver. So the signals going to the liver don't get there properly. And then the liver's not getting the right information to help send other messages out to the rest of the body. And that's only like a small fraction of it. The, there's a triangle, the thyroid, the heart, and the adrenals. So when I find people have an ongoing thyroid dysfunction, whether it be hyper or hypo, hypo means slow, hyper means too fast. When I find that, I'm always finding that the adrenals have been affected because 
guess who does the work of the dysfunctional thyroid, you know, for years until it gets too bad? It's the adrenals. And we all are familiar with adrenals, I think, at this point for handling stress and like as if the world isn't full of enough stress right now, right? So our adrenals are always being tested. The thyroid is being tested. Also, if you think about it, it's situated here. So all the food that you take in, whether it be full of pesticides or other chemicals, metals, you know, that type of thing, it goes right by your thyroid. So for people that don't think that can affect, well, you know, everybody's got their opinion, but for me, it's like a no brainer. Everything that goes by that thyroid affects the thyroid. So I guess that's it for the thyroid. You know, we could get into really detailed stuff, but that's not going to interest anybody. It's a little too much probably. So do you think that like there is that, that you're seeing so many people with thyroid issues is just an effect of our modern day stresses in terms of lifestyle? Or do you think there's actually something frequency wise, technology wise, or nutrition wise rise that is intentionally targeting the thyroid? Um, intentionally, I'm not 100% uh, convinced of less intentionally than everything else that's being done to us, right? Okay. Through the waves and everything else. Do I think the thyroid is affected by radiation? Absolutely. What do they do when they're fixing a, a thyroid, right? The, what does Western medicine use? They use radiation. Yeah. And so all of the above, Emily, all of the above, it's the quality of the food. It's the air we breathe. It's the water we drink. It is the amount of technology that's being used, the waves in the air, 5G now, right? So it's basically a little bit of everything. Genetics are involved. And one of our topics for today, Epstein-Barr virus, yeah. seems to really have an effect on the thyroid, along with the rest of the body, of course. I mean, Epstein-Barr can potentially affect everything. There are so many variations of the main Epstein-Barr that, you know, it just, to me, it's all one because just because it's affecting something different doesn't necessarily make it a variation of Epstein-Barr. Do you know what I mean by that? Yeah. So let's, um, so I want to do like kind of stick with the thyroid in the first hour and we can talk about Epstein-Barr as it relates to it and then get into the weird and the nitty gritty about Epstein-Barr because there's some very fascinating possibilities with Epstein-Barr uh, in, in the patrons segment. Um, but okay. So I, I get you. Like I don't, you know, one of the things, um, and I want to get into this in a little bit. I have a couple more questions, like basic questions about the, the, the thyroid before we go a little bit deeper with it. But one of the things that I've been really keyed into is that one of the best things to control a population or to do direct mind control on an individual is to have control of their endocrine systems. And in order to reclaim our full sovereignty as beings, we need to learn how to, with our own mind and our own way we take care of ourselves, learn to control what I've read this I started reading this really interesting book on an airplane once and I never got a chance to finish it, but I need to circle back to it. That was really talking about mastering your own glands, your own, the, when you get to the point where you can control your glands, you're unfuckwithable, right? Like when you can control when you secrete, what you secrete, how, and all that kind of stuff, then it doesn't matter what anything or anyone or any period, like you're not touchable. What do you think? About that? that makes sense to me. That makes sense to me. I mean, I'm into energy healing. Yeah. So I believe energetically, once we tap into that in ourselves and we realize the power we have ourselves, we can fix anything. That is my true belief. Have I gotten there yet? Not a hundred percent. That's why I'm still using vitamins and other supplements, right? Yeah. But, uh, I'm reading a book called The White Light right now. And there are so many good books out there. And I just take what I meant to take from each little thing, put it together, start practicing and see what works. You know, it's like, Kind of everybody I feel should be doing that. And if you're not doing that, it's because you're just not there yet. But everyone on their path will get there. And they're yeah. going to start realizing they have the control to fix their own thing. And you did bring up a good point about the thyroid. Um, you were saying, what were you saying? It was like, uh, what was the last thing you said? Past the EBV. Oh, oh. controlling the gland. Yeah. 
Oh, it's escaped me. I'll well, this, come back. this book was basically talking about like spiritual mastery or like true ascension, not the bullshit, love and light crap and whatever. Like yeah. the, the way that you do that is by learning to control your glands. Like that, that, like that is actually like even what, like the code, if you appropriately pick apart the coding of things like the Bible and other ancient texts and stuff like that, that's like really what it's getting at. Like it's many layers deep, that level of understanding, but that that's like the, that's like the real thing. Like the people who are like the true quote unquote ascended masters, right, have learned to completely control their body's um, response to any incoming factor any as right like think about like right now people's like hormones their adrenals they like their fight or flight their cortisol all this kind of stuff every day is being pinged by the news right whether it's what they claim might be going on in people's bodies right now or what they claim might be going on on the streets right. everything is designed to ping 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 agitate right and, and so like you know um those Things that happen with our nervous system when our glands secrete something can be actually really powerful tools. There are obviously evolutionary adaptations that humans have made so that they're warned when something dangerous is happening or when they need more energy or less energy so they can sleep or function or something. And if you have control over when that happens, right, then it's like um, maximizing the way you use your energy and your time and your body and whatnot. But if it's being run by something outside of you, through, you know, whether it be frequency or just idea suggestion that makes you anxious or nervous or what you're eating or whatever, then you're not actually learning to like be, run your own energy economy. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I agree. I've never really heard it put the way you're putting it as far as just having the endocrine system as being the main controller. But the truth is anyone that knows physiology, that's, you know, that is what controls how much hormones, hormone is spewed out reacting to something i suppose it's really hard to kind of isolate it out just in general because it has to work with the nervous system with the lymphatic system you know it it has to work in conjunction with all the systems but what drives it absolutely the endocrine system so i i think if you can of course if you can control your endocrine system then you're in good shape right <laughs> that being said on your way there like even just calming yourself down through deep breathing, you're inadvertently kind of controlling your endocrine system, but yeah. you're also controlling the other systems. I mean, they all work together. So it's very difficult for me to picture just working on one, fixing everything. Yeah. But I do get what you're saying. It's a really, it's a, you know, that's what the Tibetan monks have learned to do. And these rainbow body people and all those things you hear about, you know, they have learned to control everything down to not needing food to survive and down to not needing to take a breath for five, 10 minutes. You know, it's like, it's about control of everything, including the emotions. Cause it's really emotions that don't allow you to do that stuff. Absolutely. Right? Uh, okay. So you mentioned earlier that like people come and they're either a little skinnier than they'd like to be or skinnier than is healthy or a little heavier than they'd like to be or is healthy. And so we think of that, okay, when, with the metabolism too slow, hy hypo, with the metabolism too fast, hyper, but there's right. other symptoms that go along with that, right? Besides just you can't lose weight or you can't gain weight. Oh, yes. A lot yeah. of symptoms. Yes. You just maybe run through a few of those on each side of that. And then I want to kind of, after we've laid that out, I want you to get into your, um, your, I think this is your own thing. Cause I've never heard anyone else talk about it, but your theory about the hidden hyperthyroid, right? I actually was taught about that from the Uline nutritional systems, but for some reason it seems to have escaped most people. I, I I'm not sure why. Oh, I think I wanted to say before that, um, blood tests, are just not accurate when it comes to the thyroid specifically. And my most common find in my office, especially with this thing you just mentioned called hidden hyperthyroid, when they come in presenting the symptoms of that, I will almost bet my life on the spot that the blood tests have not shown any inconsistencies or just don't. And if you, what I tend to uh, like to lay out to people and it makes sense to them is that giving blood is a moment in time, right? So when you're giving blood, whatever's read is gotten out of that sample, that's what you get on your report. And that's what you think is going on in your body all the time. Yeah. So 
anyone that knows anything about the body knows we are a body in motion. Everything is dynamic. Everything is constantly moving and changing, right? You're trying to keep equilibrium, homeostasis, you name it. You're trying to keep a well-oiled machine running. So when you give that blood in that second, and the way I, I don't want to go premature into it, but the hidden hyperthyroid to, means that sometimes your thyroid is revving like hyper, and sometimes it's hypo. And so that being said, if you just ran to the doctor's office and you're late for your appointment, and then you plop down and you give your blood, your thyroid level read, which has just adapted to you running in, is going to be much different than if you'd been sitting there waiting for two hours, bored to death, and then you're totally relaxed giving blood, as relaxed as somebody's going to be, right? Yep. So that's why I believe blood tests never really show the true thyroid. And even if they do it three different times in a week or something to try to get an average, it still doesn't work. It's the same as a woman's cycle. The hormones are different, different parts of the cycle. Did you want to ask me? Yeah, I wanted to ask about, do you know anything about like doing a urinalysis? So like I, I, one of the doctors I worked with in Colorado Springs had me collect urine for 24 hours and then take a sample and send it in for my hormones um, and my thyroid, my thyroid hormones as well as my female hormones to yeah. see. And she said that that was a better measure than um, just the blood. Yeah, well, than just the blood, maybe together to compare. But, you know, I'm just, I just don't have a lot of faith in any of those Western techniques yeah. of, of gathering anything, to be honest with you. There are too many factors that can affect the outcomes. So let's say your kidneys aren't working right that day and more stuff is getting through your, your, the two kidney tubules than should be allowed. Then it's going to skew the whole test result. Yeah. Right. Let's say you have a virus and you don't realize it. Your, your kidneys are just not working up to speed or your liver's dumping stuff that just alters the test results. That's really the crux of why I don't put a lot of faith in the results. I mean, I often use and look at people's results in my findings just to get ideas though. I never take it verbatim because to me, it's really kind of meaningless for most things, not of course for everything, but for most. Yeah, I also even like, let's just forget the possibility of being late to the doctor's office and running or sitting still for two hours. If a person has any anxiety about being poked with a needle, right? That can also spike it. Like, so I don't, have anxiety about being poked with a needle but i have a very weird phenomenon if i'm giving and i didn't figure this out until it happened the first time i ever had to give blood i'm just sitting there giving blood and all of a sudden i hear she's fainting right and and i pull myself (laughs) so what i figured out is i if i see my own blood it makes me faint right so i can't look at that so that can't possibly give an appropriate reading so now if i give blood i have to look the other way you know what i mean but like some people you know it doesn't cause a mental scare for me but obviously there's some weird thing that conscious reaction yeah yeah Yeah. so um but but there's a lot of people who have anxiety even if they just tense up their muscles or or they try to breathe slower than they normally do to try and relax themselves so they're not that is altering their normal state so it isn't going to be an actor an accurate read possibly right that's right. Possibly. Yeah. yeah. Especially if you have something that responds to your state of angst. So remember I said there's a triangle, the adrenals, the heart, and the thyroid. So what do you think is going to happen if all of a sudden you're freaking out that you're, you're, getting, you're giving blood and your adrenals start going crazy, you're in fight or flight, and then part of your triangle is going to either try to make up for that mm-hmm. adrenal reaction with the heart or the thyroid or both. So, yeah, I mean, the whole point is, yes, I, that's why I find that most mistakes are found on thyroid tests, blood tests. And that's why a lot of times people go into their hospital, get their blood done and they try to fix it with medication and it doesn't work at all. In fact, most of the time, the stories that come to my office are people that got worse after their medication was put. So okay. getting back to um, char- characteristics of hypo and hyper. Yeah. So hyper, let's look at that first. In my opinion, besides the hyper uh, hypo fluxation, you know, with the hidden hyperthyroid thing, A hyperthyroid is often misdiagnosed as ADHD in children because this will interest a lot of people. And I wouldn't say it with such confidence 
if by giving them a couple of little things like a, a fish oil with a lot of DHA and some calcium and watch that ADH child turn into a regular focused, relaxed child, if that didn't happen so often, I wouldn't even say it with this much conviction, but it's just such an easy fix and they're either hiding it from us or they're not being told and nobody's figuring it out. I, I don't know what's going on, but our children need this information out there because it's such an easy way to stop a lifetime of being labeled bipolar mm -hmm. or just hyperactive or depressed because uh, one of the symptoms of hypothyroid is depression. We use that word too loosely, by the way, I, I, I feel. I mean, just a melancholy feel, maybe a lack of drive, that's coming from the thyroid mm -hmm. when it's not functioning properly. Hyper is almost manic sometimes, and that's anxiety. Yeah. So hyperthyroid, the thyroid starts going crazy. If it's hidden hyperthyroid, it reacts to physical activity. So if you even walking up the stairs at the top of the stairs, a lot of people tell me, yes, I feel something revving, thinking I'm out of shape, which really has nothing to do with it at that time. So technical characteristics are oily hair and dry hair, dry with hypo, oily with hyper, you know, hair loss with hypo. Okay, that's a big thing. People coming to me, they have no idea about the thyroid, but they come to me with my hair's falling out endlessly. I mean, there are other reasons, of course, but the thyroid is a major player in hair loss. A typical scenario for somebody's thyroid gone too long, too you know, just too hypo for too long is they, they lose the, the outer third of their eyebrow. And so, but to me, that's like way beyond and it's been going on a super long time and uh, you know, they have needed help. I was gonna say one of the things I noticed um, in, for me is that the nail beds, the moons and the nail beds were pretty much absent in all my fingers except my thumbs. And uh, the doctor told me that once I got on the thyroid medication, they would come back and I've been on thyroid medication for, over 10 years now and they really they haven't come back all the way um, on my left hand I think I have to the middle finger and I just have my index and thumb finger on the right hand so um, I know that that's another sign of like hypothyroidism is you've lost those moons in your nail beds yeah I think where that's really leading us is to our next topic that we don't want to talk about that much yet because <laughs> I, I really do think that that has more to do with that than the actual thyroid. And it's a, it's a, a, a symptom they've noticed. And ah. so among many other things. Correlation is not causation. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. right. Okay. So I have, um, so oh, dry skin. I'm sorry. Dry skin, hypo, oily skin, hyper goes with the hair though, you know, similar. Yeah. Okay. And then with the hidden hyperthyroid, so like that was the thing that like I came and presented. And since then, like some other people I know who've been to you said that you said the same about that. Now for me, I think it was a little difficult to unwind because I also came to you when I had been, had this thing where I was in a lake and I got parasites. And so that was causing some anxiety. So it was hard to untease, like tease what was what out. Right. Right. But so, like what I understood the hidden hyperthyroid to be is that like, I think it's, overactive except for when it's underactive <laughs> right yeah. like it's, it's kind of like when i say i like everything except for the things i don't like right <laughs> like that well, i think you're partly right really what you're dealing with is a tired thyroid so yeah. there's a difference between a hypothyroid which is an underproducing thyroid because of uh, something wrong with the thyroid or if it's just tired mm -hmm. and so why is it tired because it spent so much time being hyper Mm -hmm. So finally, at some point, if the person doesn't eat exactly right or doesn't get enough sleep, which, you know, in our younger years, this happens a lot. So you, once a thyroid poops out, oh, that's what I wanted to talk to you about before. The infertility. Oh, that's interesting. So, I was just thinking about that. <laughs> so the high, when I was telling you about the hormones, well, the thyroid hypo, when it goes into its burnt out state just doesn't give the signals for the hormones. So I'll, I would say, I have to say out of all my infertility cases, which I've had quite a few at this point, uh, I've, there's only one that hasn't, I haven't been able to get 
to actually conceive. And there were other, other circumstances involved there. But for the most part, what I do is I just fix their thyroid. Mm -hmm. It's like almost uncanny how fixing the thyroid and then together with that comes the adrenal supporting those within a couple of months, people are getting pregnant. Yeah. I say I got them pregnant, but you know, that's a little, right. <laughs> but, but hey, you know, it just, I, out. it just comes out that way. Sometimes. I had, I had a client who was struggling to get pregnant. You know what I mean? Like for a long time and came to me for nutritional consultation to, you know, sort of try and get her body in the best, you know, place to either become pregnant naturally, or if they decided to try in vitro again, that it would take. Right. And, you know, we made a lot of modifications to the diet, but the biggest thing was the removal of sugar and coffee. So there we have, you know, on a certain level, thyroid and adrenal and whatever. Okay. And very quickly, she, you know, about two months, two or three months into our working together, she got pregnant, right? And so like, it's it, that is, I, I hadn't thought of it necessarily about a thyroid thing. I knew adrenals were an issue with her because of the coffee consumption, right? Uh, you know, because uh, a lot of coffee with her, not just a little bit. Oh. Um, but yeah, so those, absolutely. So it is, that is interesting because you, yeah. you struggle with some of that stuff, right? Oh, I struggled with fertility. Yeah. Oh. A lot and the, supposedly there were other things involved because I had a gluten issue that I didn't know about and a methylation problem that I didn't know about and so there were a lot of all leading to our other not to be talked about yet topic <laughs> <laughs> so the, okay so I want to I'm gonna pull up Phil's questions for a second because I did want to address Graves disease um, here he had a question well his these were these were his questions I want to make sure I get to this before, well, his question was, one, does, does one ever really recover from thyroid issues, right? And he, wants, he said he'd been diagnosed with Graves' disease only to be later told that um, he has hypothyroidism. I have a cousin that had Graves' disease and has her thyroid removed, but is still on thyroid medication. I don't understand. Like, I, what is the deal here? Like, I, can you kind of explain some of that? Is it possible to fully recover or is there always something that has to be managed? And like the Graves disease question, uh, yeah. Uh, well, they just like to give names to conditions of either hypo or hyperthyroid, right? It's uh, whatever gentleman in the history of our, you know, discoveries of, of thyroid conditions got to throw their name on a, on a set of symptoms that either really are hyper or hypo. So that's why I never really talk about those diagnoses. And I ask people to please get them out of your, out of your brain in existence, because the truth is we just need to stabilize your thyroid, whether that means calming it down or speeding it up, you know, and that's where that hidden hyperthyroid is so important because it's a little tiny test you do, and it's not a blood test. And because of my intuitive way of working now, I don't need to do this. And that's why you guys probably don't know, but in the old days I used to, and this is the way I was taught, I'll have you stand there I'll muscle test your thyroid, generally test it to zero. Then I'll have you jog on the spot for one minute. Then I go back to your thyroid exactly the same way. And all of a sudden it's revving at like 60 or 80 instead of a, a, a 10, which is supposed to be a 10 on that scale. So then right away, I know what I'm dealing with. I'm, it's an overreacted thyroid to physical activity, which is essentially the marker for whether you have hidden hyperthyroid or not. Now, if you have a zero thyroid and you jog and it's still a zero, then yeah, I'm dealing with a hypothyroid. And so that's just going to let me support your thyroid and not worry about the set of other things that I do when it's hidden hyper. And you know, the, the hard part about this is somebody will present with a thyroid that's so not functioning and it doesn't come out right away that it's hidden hyper. I have to actually get through a couple of layers of healing. Mm -hmm. And then, kaboom, there's your hidden hyperthyroid. So it's not as clear cut and easy as that always. We have so many other things interfering. But for the most part, I have to tell you that the majority of the people have hidden hyperthyroid. So that when you talk to your friends that see me and they go, oh, she said I have that. You know, people can say what they, they want really. And I've heard other holistic healers say this, but there are certain conditions that are just in epidemic proportions right now. And that is one of them. Yeah. 
I, that's interesting. I remember when the first time I went to you, you even said, I remember this, oh, you're actually all, all pretty good because I was super clean with my diet at that point. Like I had really been on several months of like being pretty perfect with my diet. You're like, so you said it's rare that you find that on the first session with somebody that, you know, so I had the parasite issue, but you're like, oh, we're good. It's just the parasites and this, I can, you know, everything else is good. But everyone else that I've known who you've mentioned that to, it's usually come later, a couple of sessions in that you sort of, that you sort of find that I just dropped my list of questions. As for the Graves disease or, or the removal of the thyroid. Like, I find that fascinating. Like, my cousin had her thyroid removed, but is still on thyroid medication. Is this kind of like, is this, if we look at it a different way, evidence that, like, even if you don't actually have something, like, it's kind of like the idea of, like, a phantom organ or a phantom thing. Like, you can still, like, holographically or through intention or whatever, it's still functioning. Like, is it, I don't, I, I'm having trouble formulating exactly what I mean here, right? But, like, what is that if a person doesn't have a thyroid but still has issues with their thyroid? and has to be on medication for something that they oh, don't because, have. because the thyroid is responsible for T3 and T4, among other hormones. Okay. So your body needs those, whether you have a thyroid or not. So well, what the medicine is just that. The medicine is just creating those yeah. hormones. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yeah. That's a, what's supposed to be happening. But I learned, and I never really researched it to find out if it's true or do we have any proof in what I do, but that your kidneys can actually start – um, creating some of these hormones, producing the hormones among other tissue in your body and that your thyroid can actually start growing back. Okay. Now, scientifically we think, Oh, that's impossible. But there have been noted cases of people who had a thyroid removed, whether they left a tiny little bit of the tissue or whatever the case may be. To me, that makes a little more logical sense. If they left a little that it grew. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But if I'm not mistaken, I've also had read about cases where they completely, or at least thought they completely removed it, and then it actually grew, started growing back. All right. So, cool. the, you know, the body's a miraculous piece of machinery. I, I mean, nothing surprises me at all. So you also said earlier, you referred to this, but I just want to make sure that the question is fully asked and answered. He wanted to know, does the liver work in conjunction with the thyroid? You did reference that earlier, but we didn't go deep in there. So can you elaborate a little bit on the connect? Because we've talked about the adrenals, the triangle, which is the, the thyroid, the heart, and the adrenals. How is right. the liver, kind of, and you just talked about the kidney and the way it works sometimes with the thyroid can even start to back it up and do some of the things the thyroid can't do. What about the liver? So... I mean, just to answer that question about any organ, everything is related, right? Yeah. Every, anything can cause anything, everything is related. So since the liver is responsible for so many different things, I mean, literally so many different things. And the, one of the most important is filtering stuff out, dumping it into the bowel so that we can excrete it, yes? Yeah. So... But my connection to the thyroid that I have found is the signaling to release or the signal for the production of hormones that goes through the liver stops happening. And so do I even know if this is in the biology notebooks? I really don't know. These are my findings that I find throughout. And as soon as I, like I can test a thyroid case and I will do the estrogen measuring, the progesterone, testosterone, everything that, you know, the, the quote unquote important hormones and the levels are way off. I think this may have happened with you, Laura, mm -hmm. that things were off. But when you fix the thyroid and then the liver is getting the right signals, all of a sudden, boom, those things start to balance out some miraculous way. And that's just like, that's the big thing with the liver. But I'm sure there are other things I not really coming to mind right now, but I'm sure that because of the T3, T4, right? T4 produced by the thyroid then has to convert in the mitochondria. Do you know what the mitochondria do? They're the, yep. the power energy, energy the production, of the energy day. production, ATP in the cells in each individual cell. So imagine if that's not going on, like how is any cell really up to par in your body? If your thyroid's not giving that to you, right? Yeah. So yeah. think of it that way. But yes, absolutely affects the liver, the pancreas, the spleen, the uterus, the prostate. Everything is affected by the thyroid. 
cool. One of the things that I uh, started doing before I met you um, was that uh, the medical medium had a book called The Thyroid Healing. And I went through this book because I was trying to get off thyroid medication and heal my thyroid because I really believed in what I was reading. And there, at the time, a lot of people had said that they were doing it and were healing their thyroids. And I got the book, read it. It talks a lot about EBV, and which we're going to talk about later. But one of the main things that I got out of that was drinking all this celery juice. <laughs> and so I was drinking tons and tons of celery juice and I felt worse and worse. And I don't, I felt like it damaged me more than it helped me. And so I got off of it and went back to the doctor and got back on thyroid medication um, so that I could just start to feel better. And I feel like this guy kind of is doing a little bit of a disservice to people who are really serious about healing their thyroids. I, there's not really medical evidence backing up drinking celery juice to heal your thyroid. Okay, so, and, and I understand your take because of your personal experience, yes. which just fortifies my theory about other things are involved. And he can't possibly, that can't possibly be the safe for everyone. Otherwise, what are we doing? Everybody just get on celery juice and it fixes everything. Right? <laughs> I mean... <laughs> Do, and I've tested this with my own body. I did very well on celery juice because I was at the time not producing the acids that my stomach needed to, to break down my food properly. So that to me is the main thing about the celery. And by getting those acids in your stomach, you help all the other processes, getting the nutrients out of your food, making the most of things, right? Having them properly broken down. Now, can I talk about you personally? Sure. Okay, so turns out you have a detoxification pathway problem, right? Yeah. That was why you didn't do well on celery juice. Mm. So he should maybe say, because it does cause a lot more intense detox, the celery juice. He sure. should maybe put out there that if you tend to not detox properly, which most people, unfortunately, they don't realize. So he could say, okay, if you tend to get eczema or rashes, or if you tend to have high allergies, he could say certain things that would clue people in that, oh, maybe this isn't for me. Or just as simple as, okay, if you start to do the celery and you don't feel good on it, then just please stop. That means your body's not ready for that step yet. That's what he should put out there because I'm, you're not my only one. Okay. And so this big thing that I have really focused in on, the detox pathways, which gets very involved, as you know, and gets very complicated, has to do with everything that causes a detox, which happens to be everything the medical medium is about. He's about detoxing your body. So if your pathways don't support your ability to detox, you're in trouble. And that's really the biggest negative I see about an otherwise very positive Thing going on with this medical medium movement okay he's got some really good information yeah so phil also had, had a question about this book called thyroid healing from the medical okay. medium and, and whatnot my my take like on all this because i of course started hearing about it when it was happening and noticing that all of a sudden all the juice places i go to were also just selling plain celery juice and whatever is that and this goes for everything. There is no one answer for everybody, period, ever, end of story. Like there's no one right diet that works for everybody. That's my point. That's yeah. my point. Yes. But also there was no discussion from him about the importance of making sure that your celery is organic. So a lot of people mm -hmm. who are just going and buying tons and tons of celery. And if you, it certainly even if you wash your celery, if there's crap all over it, it's in there. But maybe if, you know, a lot of people don't perfectly wash their vegetables. So then even if they might have been doing something good with the celery, they're now consuming a bunch of, you know, That's pesticides and glyphosate and whatever the heck else is on there and metals from the fucking chemtrails and this and that and the other thing. So then there's all this stuff in their system. Right. So I noticed that so that like that, that was never discussed. Like there's never that distinction made, which I think is important. And that's often something I criticize people in vegan uh, who propose vegan stuff is they're, they're they don't they get they're not pushing involved. the organic thing. They get too involved in the ethics and the religious part of the vegan diet and don't talk enough about making sure the quality of food you eat is good, making sure that you're not eating more sugar because you're not eating protein and fat and blah blah. They don't they don't do that. 
And then the other thing with this, the little, literally, like I thought this was hilarious, but it just shows how somebody doing this can have all these other so physical implications for some people and social implications and, and whatnot is literally the price of juice at everywhere that I, because I was really into green juice at the time, went up because there was a celery shortage because people were buying so much celery. And literally there was like signs up that said, we've had to raise the prices of our juices 50 cents because there's a celery shortage. Right. Yeah, I, heard, I heard similar things and probably only in California, but you know, <laughs> I heard that the grocery stores were upping their prices of celery too. And, and that's one of the other things I didn't like happened is I think it was pure encapsulations who at first the medical medium was saying had really good product, which mm -hmm. is true. They do. But like literally within a couple of weeks, they really escalated their prices, which I just, you know, there's so many ethical and moral standards that should come along with this being healthy movement and this mm -hmm. service to other movement that we're going through and just an awakening like that should to me always mm -hmm. come with it. But I'm learning very quickly that, that, that <laughs> it's not the case. Well, one of the things that, I mean, this sounds like a silly, silly thing, but like, you know, when you watch professional sports that, the players have their sponsors patches on their shirt or on their hat. You can see who they're sponsored by. And I feel like people who are giving medical advice or, or different kinds of things like that, if they have an affiliation with, there's nothing wrong with having an affiliation. If you think something is good, as long as you're disclosing what that affiliation is and how much you're, you don't have to give exacts, but like if, if it's that, if it's a main portion of your, 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 you know, uh, money making you need to people need to understand that that you have a reason why you're saying that that isn't just that you think it's good right so i think a lot more transparency in terms of you know people's affiliations when they're making recommendations um yep. is, well that's why i think medical medium stopped recommending specific things yeah, you know? yeah. yeah. because he ran into that issue like here's a guy i don't think he knew he was going to get as popular as he did and yeah. We have to keep in mind he's just a regular guy with yes. his gift, right? Yes. So he's only human and he's going through his human changes and responding yeah. with his human characteristics. Mm -hmm. But I think it's kind of a learn as you go scenario, which is for most of us, right? I've had, I've had uh, 20 years of being a chiropractor. The last 10 spent honing my nutrition stuff. The last five, the intuitive stuff. So, yeah. You know, did I make mistakes along the way? Of course I have. A lot of things I didn't know, but it's just, it's just a natural progression. And he's going to go through his things and we'll see. Right now, I think the benefit is outweighs the, the opposite of him, for example. And one gift I have received from him is, you know, looking things at another perspective, yet another perspective, because I take everything I hear and I do my own personal testing methods that you guys are well aware of, but you know, I just figure things out and that's my intuition as well as just some um, kind of manifesting that I do, you know, and then I come up with answers. So a lot of stuff's going on and I can't be alone. Other practitioners have to be going through this the same yeah. as I, right? So we just have to be a little understanding. We can't get angry at people for trying to do things. We just have to kind of go with the flow and everybody's, if they are of coming from a good place and their yeah. intention is good, then you just have to take everything they say with a grain of salt and make your own decisions about stuff, well, you know, I, take responsibility. I want to add one thing to their intentions. If, if their intentions truly are good and they get something wrong and it's brought to their attention, they'll address their mistake. Correct. Correct. Yeah. That's like a big one for me because there's a lot of people out there who can say that their intentions are great, but if they're, you know, once you become like aware that, that you either that you've made a mistake and that you're wrong acknowledging it or even if you're not sure even if you still think you're right but there seems to be a counter something people are saying that has some relevance acknowledge it don't just pretend it doesn't exist right, right. i think that's kind of important and you guys high. both know me i'm very transparent yeah. i can right in front of you think oh my god you might be right i never thought of that before boom here we go and then it leads us to another discovery right absolutely all so, right
So last question on this segment before we sort of move on over and just because right. we're sort of the bridge here is how does the thyroid connect to the EBV situation? Because that's a big part of the medical mediums book and that was part of Phil's question, but you also brought it up. So let's kind of like give a little brief description of that and then we'll end this segment and we'll, we'll pick up with EBV in the other half. Okay, so for people that don't know, EBV stands for Epstein-Barr virus and it is being found in my practice, I'm finding it in at least 90 some percent of my patients, okay? Which is very alarming if you think about it for a virus that is also known as mononucleosis or mono, you know, when you were in high school or whatever, kids got mono. Turns out that first stage or second stage of mono is highly contagious. And that's why so many people, you know, that, that fed that you could literally be in the classroom with them and you would end up with that. You okay there? I, I'm having a huge revelation right now as we're talking. Oh. That is, <laughs> I thought you were having a hot flash. <laughs> no. Well, like, it's just like, it's so strong, the intuition that I'm having right now about something that it was okay. like, oh my God. And it's, okay, so I'm going to write it down while you guys continue talking and then we'll address it in the next, the next. Oh, you do that, you okay. do that. So, so this virus to me, it's kind of simple. It gets in your central nervous system, mm -hmm. which if, for those people that may not realize, it is your spinal cord and your brain, right? Yes. Runs brain down. Literally every nerve in your body, which if you peeled your skin off and just had the nerve showing, you would be able to still tell exactly what you look like. Okay, that's how many nerves we have in our body. So it's kind of a gross thing, but you know, just picture a bunch of nerves with exactly the same characteristics without the skin, you would be able to totally see it was you. So the virus gets into the central nervous system and then literally can go to any nerve in your body from there because everything is joined, nothing is separated in our bodies. We are not a com compartmentalized being. And that's aside from the energy thing that we are, right? The light body that we are. So this virus can literally be the cause of any dysfunction in any nerve. So just marinate that for a minute and look at the implications there, okay? So, and I'm talking about even little dark spots on your skin, all right? It could be that discreet and it could be that singular. And then the virus also has the ability to lay dormant in your body. Mm -hmm. Totally go to sleep, not wake up, not do anything. Those are the main points about it. I mean, if you really think about that is so huge right there and like how we get it and everything, eh, we might talk about that later because we really don't know, right? A virus is a virus. Do viruses kind of, now the theory that's coming out with all the virologists is that all our viruses are in our body already and as they present themselves, they're actually just coming out. It's nothing. It's the exosome theory. Like right? that. Yes. Yeah. yes. Yeah. So my thought for that, as well as pretty much everything, is that there's probably cases of all of the above happening. Okay, so the connection then between the thyroid and Epstein-Barr virus is what's stopping the virus from getting into your thyroid. Absolutely nothing. Yeah. It follows the nerves that innervate, that supply the thyroid, right? Easy peasy. If you happen to be one of the unfortunate ones that those the virus does trickle down to your thyroid, then you have thyroid issues. If it's one that trickles down to your spleen, you have spleen issues. I mean, it's just kind of that simple. You know, I know it's more complicated than that, but just for starting conversation, that's really how simple it is. All right. Awesome. We're going to move over to the patrons hour. Before we do that, can you, I know your practice is in transition right now and you're going through some evolution in the way you're presenting yourself and whatnot. So why don't you tell people what you're doing and where they can find you? Um, well, I have, and it's not just because of COVID. This was in my, in my aspirations. I just didn't know it was going to happen this quickly. And that is that I'm now completely virtual. I'm not going to have an office that people come to me in person. And so the type of patients I've been getting, the way things have just been working out, it's made it possible for me. So I'm super excited. My platform has not been totally fixed up yet, but it will be. And then I will be 
having a new website and a new platform that's HIPAA compliant so we can speak very privately and you know all that other stuff that comes on with HIPAA. But um, keysburyhealthcenter.com is my website. And the website now does not lead you there yet, but that's because it hasn't happened yet. So by the end of July, everything should be in full swing. And when you go to my website, then there will be links to the platform and that's where you're going to be able to set up your own appointments and I will be doing everything virtually. So for now, I, people can go to your website and call for a, a regular appointment that you do. That's how they would make an appointment now, yes. Okay. Just call. And, you know, I realize not everybody's tech savvy and not everybody does the computer thing or the, the phone, the smartphone. So we're always going to be available to call no matter what. Cool. All right. So stick with us, guys, to the other side. We're going to talk about Epstein-Barr virus. I have another, a couple of questions that came up during the first hour that I thought would be interesting for over there as well. And then also this sort of theory and connection that I just put together here. I'm going to run it by you, even though some of it might be a little out of your general wheelhouse, maybe not so much. All right, guys. So join us at patreon.com forward slash off planet media, and we'll see you on the other side. <laughs>